Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Obesity is a major health crisis resulting in conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea. But here in the United States, obesity and being overweight affect two-thirds of our population. Our guest today is trying to change that as a specialist in obesity and weight management. Please welcome Dr. Rekha Kumar. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for having me. Now, it's great to have you. And, you know, we've been looking forward for this conversation for a while. I know you've helped a lot of people in my department and my staff and some of my family members. So this conversation is going to be fun. It's going to be very enlightening for our listeners. So thank you for being here. Of course, it's awesome to be here. So first, so how'd you get interested in obesity and weight management? It's not something you really see a lot in medical school. So what kind of started this interest of yours? So I would say that my interest actually started well before medical school. I was interested in fitness and exercise and metabolism way back. I was a gymnast for 15 plus years and I think I was always interested in muscle metabolism, nutrition, and I always said I'd be a biology teacher in the high school. And I think my interest just kept taking me deeper into the science of nutrition and metabolism, which led me to endocrinology and yeah. medicine. So it actually predates my interest in medicine. So how do you become an obesity specialist? Do you have to do conventional training or is there some specialty that you can focus on? Basically anyone can be an obesity medicine specialist and I think should be. There is a board certification given by the American Board of Obesity Medicine. So you can get board certified in the field, but you do have to have a primary board. So You don't go into obesity medicine right after medical school, and there isn't a residency yet, but there is a fellowship. So there are people that choose to do fellowship training and get board certified, and people come from primary care, internal medicine, uh, surgery, GI. It's It's a whole mix of people that are interested in incorporating obesity treatment into their practices. No, I I totally agree with what you said is how every doctor or every healthcare provider should be an obesity specialist, just like I in pain management say... Every doc should treat pain because these are the things that our patients come in with. So that's great. So I want to jump right into it because we have a lot to cover and I'm excited about things that we're going to discuss. So so many people struggle with weight loss. You know, the United States loves being top in the world in different things. And unfortunately, we are kind of top in the world in obesity, you know, top 20 in the world with an average BMI of 28.8. So can you tell us what is BMI? What does it stand for? And how do you use this number to dictate your treatment? BMI, or body mass index, is a number that is calculated based on height and weight. So we calculate body mass index by dividing weight in kilograms over height in meters squared. It's just an equation. You can calculate it on yourself, on anybody. If somebody goes to the internet, they can calculate their BMI. But this also can become a little bit dangerous because it There's cutoffs that are out there saying someone with a BMI over 25 is overweight or a BMI over 30 has obesity. And and we have to be careful with this because BMI just says how big somebody is. It doesn't necessarily say how much fat somebody has. So it is one measurement. It's good when you're looking at populations of people. It is not always great when you're looking at an individual because it doesn't distinguish between bone mass, muscle mass, fat mass. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. You see a bodybuilder and someone not a bodybuilder the same height, they might differ in weight by 30, 40 kilograms, and you might call someone obese, but really they may not be obese. Absolutely, and I always use the example when I lecture that Arnold Schwarzenegger at his peak bodybuilding health had a BMI that put him into class one obesity category, which obviously had very low body fat. So that's an example where BMI doesn't apply. And on the other end, you can see people that have no muscle mass, all fat and bones, and that's not healthy either. Right, so you would tell the listeners, you know, don't, focus on the BMI as an objective measurement to target your health. But it's something population controlled, but not on the individual basis. Completely. And I think it's a good screening tool. So for for physicians, if someone does keep track of BMI and it's going up in adult medicine, adults should not be, we don't get taller. Got it. Unless they're working out a lot and building a lot of muscle. Hard to do, but on the margin, they could gain some mass. Yeah. Gotcha. Let's talk about diet. You know, there's a lot of fads out there, intermittent fasting, keto, Atkins, South Beach. What's your take on what works, what doesn't work? What should people really know about when it comes to dieting? All of those things are typically called fad diets for a reason. They work 
typically we only have short-term information on them because they're they're pretty intense and often not sustainable. I wouldn't necessarily say one is better than the other. One might be better for one individual over another. For example, somebody that has a blood sugar problem might lean towards a lower carbohydrate approach like Atkins or keto or something like that. But a lot of these diets are so restrictive that we don't have much information beyond three months, six months, or maybe a year, often because people can't stick to them. Sure. You know, the, the papers come out that saying every diet works if you stick to it. If you do low carb or low fat or whatever, the data kind of suggests they all work. Do you believe that that's true? Yeah, and the data has shown that actually several times. There's a famous JAMA paper that actually compares the Atkins diet to the Ornish diet to the Zone diet. Um, I think there's there's one more diet in there, but basically to a low-fat diet. And if you look at the difference in weight loss, it's really all the same. But if you look at dietary adherence score, there is a difference. So anyone that sticks to any of those loses weight. The key is just sticking to something that actually works for you in the long term. So do you have like a treatment algorithm? Someone comes in who's overweight. Let's call them BMI of 30 plus. Is there a initial strategy that you employ with these patients? Totally. So what's great about this field and the growing science and is that there's actually guidelines now um, for primary care physicians to screen patients. So basically looking at height, weight, and body mass index at every visit. If we do catch a BMI that falls in the overweight or obesity categories, the first thing we would do is screen for comorbidities. So we say, all right, the weight is high. Is there a medical complication or comorbidity such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arthritis? mood concerns, depression related to weight. So it could be, you know, medical, functional, mental. There's there's several complications of having overweight or obesity. Sure, right. So I would say we would first look to see if there's complications and we would aim to treat those while we aim for weight loss as well. So but between like low carb or low fat, you know, people go back and forth. There used to be low fat, which is why all these low fat foods came out. Then Atkins came out. Do you find that one is better or even easier to stick to than another? Yeah, I see what you're saying. So we have found in our practice that low glycemic or lower carb diets tend to be easier to stick to for a longer period of time, likely because uh, fullness to the brain is actually signaled by protein and fat. And so that whole era of the low-fat diets of, you know, things that were loaded with sugar but not fat, people were hungry. So it defeats the purpose. I mean, there's definitely situations we need people on low-fat diets, people that have some inherited cholesterol problems and chronic pancreatitis and issues like that, and we do recommend low-fat diets in certain cases, but generally we recommend low glycemic over low-fat. So things like keto, you know, keto became popular for me maybe a couple years ago, and I have a lot of friends who do keto religiously, and you see what they eat. They're eating bacon and eggs and a lot of these things that look really unhealthy to me. Should they be concerned about cholesterol and fat and things like that when they're performing this diet? You know, I think I think they should be. I think they should be monitored. There's kind of two schools of thought in the academic world of diets. There's the insulin carbohydrate model and then the kind of calories in, calories out model. Those people are constantly debating each other yeah. on whether a calorie is a calorie or whether different calories coming from carbohydrates that stimulate the hormone insulin are different. And the people that support that insulin carbohydrate theory are proponents typically of the keto diet and think that you really can eat anything you want because you're using a different source of fuel and you're, you know, breaking down fats. But I think we just really don't know, like long term or super long term, the effects on cholesterol and heart health. Sure. You know, you brought up a good point. I wrote a newsletter last year entitled The Calorie is Not a Calorie. So I'm interested to hear your opinion on that because I I promote that. I believe calories in equals calories out. And if you're in a deficit, you have no choice but to lose weight. Is that wrong thinking or how would you you kind of I think that's correct, but I think the other theory is correct too. So it's probably a little of both. If a calorie is a calorie, then as long as somebody stays below their caloric needs... In theory, someone should always be losing weight. But that doesn't happen because we don't lose weight to zero and plateaus happen at different times for people. And so the quality of those calories probably does matter and is different for everyone. So I do agree with you that the calorie approach, it's 
basic physics, it makes sense. But I think as we look at things more closely, that there's probably a difference in different types of calories. So why not just, what do you say to people? Say, let's just, just starve, just fast and don't eat, intake almost zero calories and you'll lose weight. Does that philosophy work? So someone will lose weight if they starve themselves, but they'll also have something called metabolic adaptation. Their brains and their bodies will catch on pretty quick. They will hit a plateau and they typically have rebound weight gain. The reason for this is really it's a mechanism of survival. If the brain senses an energy deficit like that, whether it's starvation from very low calories or excessive exercise, the brain goes into a mode to conserve energy, reduce the metabolism, Uh, Usually when there's rapid weight loss like that from starvation, there's often muscle loss. No matter how you lose weight, a portion of that will always be muscle, and muscle determines your resting metabolic rate. And so as you lose weight, you have to eat less and less to maintain that weight. Gotcha. Let's let's talk about that. You hit a really good point about metabolic rate. You know, we talk colloquially, you know, they're, they're blessed because they're just genetically skinny. They can eat whatever they want, and they weigh the same. Whereas someone else might say, I eat a peanut, and I gain five pounds. So there is some truth to this metabolic rate. What is this basal metabolic rate and can you biohack it? Can you change it to work in your favor? Your metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate is basically um, how much energy you burn at rest. And that's just energy required to carry out basic bodily functions. And there is variation in different people. There's equations that are used to measure this number based on sex, height, weight, age. And then there's more precise ways to measure these things as well. But there are factors that affect it, such as genetics. People's genetics strongly influence their set point body weight. And this concept of having a set point, I think, is something that is not well understood. But the science really does support that just the way our brain has a thermostat for temperature and sodium levels. There is some type of thermostat for what a healthy body weight and body fat is for certain people. And in my practice as an endocrinologist, I will see over-exercisers that are low body fat. They might not be low body weight, they might not be low BMI, but they're too low body fat for healthy reproduction, and they'll get referred for infertility. So it's interesting. There are different percentages of fat mass that one's brain perceives good health at. Right. You know, you you brought up hormonal regulation and the thermostat analogy. Presumably, our body's thermostat is kind of set the same for our entire life. We want to be 97, 98 degrees. Our sodium levels are kind of set also. Does our weight set point change with time or events in life, like having a baby? Or as men get older, you see the bodies change. Absolutely. Yeah, great question. And people don't love hearing this, but it appears that the weight thermostat only knows how to go up. And it only knows how to remember that high weight, which is why every time somebody yo-yo diets and reaches a new high weight, it gets harder and harder to lose weight. And so that there is more flexibility in the weight thermostat than there is in the temperature thermostat or the sodium thermostat. But it seems like it it only knows how to re-register the high weight. Which brings me to one another topic. You know, as an assistant professor here at Weill Cornell and endocrinologist, you work a lot with something called obesity pharmacotherapy. What is this? What is pharmacotherapy for obesity, and when do you employ these strategies? So pharmacotherapy, um, just like in other fields of medicine, it is used when lifestyle intervention alone is not sufficient to help someone achieve a healthy weight. So the more we learn about body weight regulation, this very challenging weight thermostat that only knows how to go in one direction, as well as the concept of metabolic adaptation, that the more weight someone loses, the harder it is to keep it off, and their biology is kind of against them. There's been a growing interest in using pharmacotherapy to help people lose weight and keep weight off. And the purpose of using these medicines isn't just to reduce someone's weight, but to prevent the comorbidities of excess weight from occurring, such as diabetes, hypertension, and sleep apnea, all the things you mentioned. So there are five FDA-approved medicines for long-term use and several medicines used for short-term use. There are criteria to use these medicines. It's a body mass index of 30 or greater or a body mass index of 27 or greater with a comorbidity. And what do you, what do you notice when you start patients on these medications? First of all, these are for presumably people who fit into the obese category. 
And what have you seen in terms of results with these medications? So they all work differently, and we kind of, you know, don't choose them haphazardly. And it's no different than um, choosing an antihypertensive or choosing chemotherapy. It looks like one disease, right? Cancer is one disease, but there's so many subtypes. And there's probably subtypes of obesity. So not everyone that has obesity is hungry. So we don't give everyone an appetite suppressant. Some people have cravings. Others don't. Some people are doing everything right and their weight's not budging. So we have to choose medicines that target different neurohormonal pathways in different people based on what we think the mechanism of their obesity is. What if, what if you're an individual who doesn't fit into that obese category? You might be someone like me. I want to lose five or 10 pounds. I used to have great abs and now I'm a dad bod and I want to shred that. Is is pharmacotherapy someone something for me or is it not? Probably a not. I see. This is where we look at risks versus benefits. And the reason that, you know, there's cutoffs for these things is that in certain populations, the risk probably outweighs the benefit. Like any other medicine, these come with side effects. And we want to make sure that we are choosing our patients appropriately for pharmacotherapy. I want to go back to the topic of the basal metabolic rate. You know, it sounds like, let's say you have a, you're great at working out, you're dedicated, you're religious about it, you're, you do high-intensity interval training, And maybe during a session of working out, you can burn 500 calories. How does 500 calories relate to how much you would typically burn with your resting metabolic rate? Is it a drop in the hat or is it actually meaningful? So it's an interesting question. If you're looking at those like numbers on the treadmill or the elliptical that say how much you've burned, they're probably not right. There's no way that that machine like can exactly know without measuring uh, your respiration and your weight and your carbon dioxide output to know exactly how much you've burned. So I would say that it's hard to really look at those numbers and know how much over your basal metabolic rate you have burned. And I think that people tend to become hungry with exercise, see those numbers, and then think that they're how much they can eat. And justify justify eating a meal. I've, I've heard this. You know, we read about Michael Phelps who swims miles and then eats 20,000 calories. He's an extreme situation, I understand, but you're absolutely right. We had a conversation the other day uh, with a buddy. He's like, if I run X number of miles, I deserve Chipotle. And that's the logic. Exactly. And there's actually an interesting group of patients that I see, which are like the former college athletes or former athletes, like football players, baseball players, gymnasts, swimmers, that gain weight later on in life. And Often, I think what happens in those cases is that their bodies got so used to such a high level of activity, and when that stops, and as adults, we have jobs, we have lives, there's no way we can maintain that level of physical activity, and the metabolism drops significantly, but the appetite actually doesn't change that much. And this is true for for many things. In my field of medicine, when I treat hyperthyroidism, people gain weight, and they always deny, you know, having been eating more when they were hyperthyroid and then we treat them and they gain all this weight and it's just that the appetite doesn't change with the metabolism sure how important if you had to look at diet versus exercise versus your genetic metabolic set point what has the most meaningful impact on how much weight you can lose in your opinion i would say genetics and diet more than exercise so if you're at the gym you're a gym rat you're exercising all day and your diet's poor you probably aren't going to get the gains or the losses that you want. Right. And and there is data on this. There are studies looking at exercise interventions alone on weight. And on average in exercise studies, people might lose like three kilograms if they're not. It's not much. Diet alone, you could lose more. Diet plus exercise is optimal. But I would say that, again, we're still always working with our genetics. And I think as we get older, our genetic potential really starts to show. I think that we can mold things more when we are younger with diet and exercise, but... As we age, it gets more challenging. It gets harder. You mentioned the importance of lean muscle in determining your resting metabolic rate. What, talk about that a little bit more. What do you mean by that? And how can we improve our lean muscle to do that? So that resting metabolic rate that determines how many calories we burn at rest is actually determined by how much muscle mass we have. And we can absolutely influence that by doing resistance training exercises. And I always, you know, meet these patients that are running five miles a day and they say, I, I want to lose weight. I'm going to start running seven miles a day. That's probably not a good strategy because the muscles actually 
do get more efficient and don't burn an incremental increase in calories with that additional cardiovascular exercise. Cardio is great for you. It's good for your heart. It's good for your brain. Everyone should do it. But in terms of increasing your metabolism, having more muscle, which we can achieve by doing resistance training exercises and getting adequate protein in the diet can help us increase our metabolism. So if you're counseling someone on more aerobic exercise versus weight resistance for losing weight purposes, what would you tell them? I would tell someone that if they have 10 minutes a day to exercise and their goal is weight loss to do resistance training. Gotcha. Protein, you mentioned that as well. How important is that part of someone's diet in order to gain that lean muscle and thereby increasing their resting metabolic rate? Protein consumption during a weight loss um, period is very important to spare your muscle and prevent muscle loss. So when somebody is losing weight, we want them to preferentially lose fat and not lose muscle so we can maintain this metabolic rate. So I would say getting adequate protein if you are an average person trying to lose weight is very important. And then even more important if you're someone that is a bodybuilder or or if you have specific goals in terms of lean mass. How much would you say, if you can, on average, is it by, by body mass, by weight, by pounds? There's so many different criteria. So I'd hate to quote something wrong. I think it depends on someone's goal. Um, but I would say it's based on body weight. So it's important, if you, even if you are fasting, to at least get that protein in to build that lean muscle. Yes, during the fasting period, if you don't have to get it then. But whenever, whatever your eating window is, you should make sure that there's adequate protein. Going back to this set point, which I know the listeners are thinking, you know, it's, it's defeated. There's no way I can lose weight. But let's, let's talk about like celebrities. We see celebrities, we see them yo-yo, we see them get fit. Should we assume that all of these celebrities have a skinny set point or have they hacked it with some strategy in order to get the body and muscle and things that they want? There's probably a little of both. Maybe they became celebrities because they looked a certain way. But I do think that there's some amount of hacking going on, healthy versus unhealthy, probably both of those. But I would say that these are people that have a lot of resources to invest in their physical appearance and their fitness and nutrition goals versus the average person. Right. What tips, right off the bat, without having an intervention or needing to see a physician, what are some tips you can give people as a lifestyle modification on how to achieve some weight loss that they desire? Yeah, so two things that I want to mention that we didn't touch on are um, healthy sleep routines and stress management. People don't realize that those two things can affect our ability to control our weight, uh, probably through hormones. So interrupted sleep, inadequate sleep, not restorative sleep increases our stress hormone levels and can lead to hormonal imbalances that increase belly fat and predispose us to metabolic disease and diabetes. That's good to hear for some of us. Yeah, I would say the same about stress. Sure. So how do, what are some strategies on people can, like, let's say you don't sleep well. Are there strategies? Would you recommend medications for those people? Again, just the way I would say with obesity, um, with sleep problems, I would try not to go to medicines first. I would try with lifestyle interventions, make sure that the sleep hygiene and the bedtime routines is healthy, making sure there's no caffeine or things like that, you know, within the close hours of bedtime. I would try to have consistent bedtimes. So what's the long-term goal? What's, what are you most excited about in the field of obesity and weight management? And how can we in the United States get off this top 10 list of obese countries in the world? Yeah, great question. I would say that I am excited about the development of new medicines that can help more people and lead to more weight loss. Because right now we're kind of always saying that the gold standard for people with extreme obesity is surgical intervention. And the percentage of Americans that are meeting criteria is tremendously high and all those people aren't going to have surgery. And so I think that, you know, bigger public health efforts at prevention, especially in the pediatric population is exciting for me. I think to introduce, you know, healthy nutrition and fitness early on, those are things that I would be excited to see in the future. And then on the other side, when people have already developed obesity, I would be excited to have new and more medicines that work better safely. Yeah, you know, we talk a lot about obesity in my practice and sports and pain medicine. Um, And the analogy I give patients is for every pound extra, you put about seven pounds on your spine or five pounds on your joints. 
So just like you said, you develop comorbidities, you develop arthritis and sleep apnea and maybe diabetes and heart disease. Uh, so the importance of maintaining healthy body weight obviously are critical. You know, in healthcare, we don't talk about that a lot. We wait for something to happen to a patient, then they come in for treatment. And prevention is not something we're great at in the United States healthcare system because insurance doesn't really want to pay for prevention. They pay for doing things, which is not ideal. So how do you kind of work around that? You know, you get reimbursed and we get reimbursed to see patients who have a problem or need help. What do you tell people on tips on preventing the need to see me in general? Yeah, so that is actually a really good question. Philosophical, right? But <laughs> It's philosophical, but it's also kind of a, you know, business of medicine question. Like, how do we invest time in counseling our patients when it's not what we were trained to do, it's not what we're paid really to do? I would say to incorporate it into what you're doing, and that's why I think everyone could be an obesity medicine specialist. If there's a way from the very beginning in all of our fields of medicine and all of our training to tie in what we do to healthy weight goals. So for me as an endocrinologist, that's that's what I do. I treat diabetes and thyroid and polycystic ovarian syndrome, and I always even if the focus of the visit isn't weight, I do bring it up and encourage weight maintenance if someone is a normal weight. You know, what, what you're doing, the work you're doing is commendable. I think working on obesity and weight management in the, on a public health perspective is, is critical for our country. We talked about metabolism, we talked about diet, exercise, and stress. And I think this day and age, especially with COVID, it's not easy to be relaxed. Everyone's kind of on edge about not getting the disease and stress. Any tips on stress management that you employ in your patients or recommend? Yeah, so I think exercise is a great natural way to handle stress. I think taking time for yourself, for ourselves, I know it's really hard right now. We're all at home with kids, families. There's no personal space. I think going on a walk, whatever amount of fresh air you can get right now, I know that we don't have control over much, but I think whatever we could do to clear our heads probably not only helps our stress, but all our healthy hormones sure. and hopefully has a positive effect eventually on weight control. No, I, think, I think what you've shared with us today is, is amazing. Um, the listeners are going to really enjoy listening to advice and hearing tips and strategies on how they can take more control of their weight. You know, we talked about set points and it gets more and more difficult, but you also mentioned don't be discouraged because there are other strategies that maybe you haven't tried, including resistance training, maybe medications if if they haven't tried, how would someone know that they've exhausted all these options and now I need to see someone like you for pharmacotherapy? I think if somebody personally feels defeated, they some people don't even know where to start. It might not even be that they've tried all the options. They don't even know where to begin. And they could actually, you know, look for a physician that understands obesity that lives in their area. You can actually go onto the website of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and put in your zip code and find a doctor that uh, knows how to do this stuff. So you were a former director, medical director of the American Obesity, American Board of Obesity Medicine. Um, are you still seeing patients? How, what's the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? Yep. So I am still seeing patients basically full time. I'm still the medical director of the board. People can find me through Wild Cornell. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Kumar, it's been a pleasure. I learned a lot today. I'm, sh I'm going to share a lot of this with my patients when I see them. Thank you for everything that you do with the patients and obesity and trying to fight this disease in our country. And thank you for taking time out of your schedule to being with us today. Thank you for having me and thank you for taking care of so many of my patients. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D.com. Come.